Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Reynolds, uh, Associate Chair for Research and Entrepreneurship in the Department of Electrical Engineering, and uh, your host for uh, today, today's colloquium. It's a pleasure to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Reed Harrison. Reed received the bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Florida and a PhD in computation and neural systems from Caltech in 2000. After completing his doctorate, he joined the electrical engineering faculty at the University of Utah and developed the first uh, low noise neural amplifiers with low enough power consumption to be integrated with high density uh, implantable electrode arrays. His 2003 IEEE Journal of Solid State Circuits paper describing this innovation has been cited more than a thousand times. In 2010, he left academia and founded Intan Technologies in Los Angeles to commercialize microelectronics for uh, large-scale neural recording. Intan supplies electrophysiology chips to companies and research groups in over 40 countries worldwide. His research interests include uh, low-power analog and mixed-signal uh, CMOS circuit design, IC design for neural interfaces and other biomedical devices, and hardware for biologically inspired computing systems. Uh, Reed has served on the technical program committees of the IEEE Solid State Circuits Conference and also the International Symposium on Circuits and Systems. So it's a pleasure to welcome Reed. Uh, thank you very much for coming to speak with us and take it away. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, work that uh, I've done over the past 15 years, both in my 10 years at the University of Utah and in the last five to six years in uh, a company that I founded. And the theme of the talk is building better tools for neuroscience uh, and specifically using microchip technology to take electrophysiology to sort of the modern era. So. Uh, Traditional electrophysiology instruments that measure electrical impulses in the body, uh, be it nerves or, or, or the brain or the spinal cord or muscles, um, are traditionally big, bulky, and ill-suited for observing the large number of signals that are in the body, right? The brain is billions of neurons. And yet, um, as of a few years ago, we were stuck with sort of this 1980s technology of large, bulky amplifiers. Uh, and we would, of course, like to build medical devices that are very uh, unobtrusive, and we'd also scientifically like to study naturally behaving animals in order to discover how the brain works, and this large, bulky equipment really hinders both approaches. So our, the technology we use for this is, to, uh, is, is uh, integrated electronics, and uh, the goal of, of all my work has been to, to integrate all analog electronics and some digital onto a single silicon chip to reduce the size, power, and cost of all this stuff. And uh, because I've been commercializing this stuff, um, we've focused our efforts on commercially available silicon foundries um, with mainstream affordable CMOS processes uh, to ensure long-term economic sustainability since we aren't dealing with massive consumer markets here. Uh, this is sort of niche markets that we're going into, and especially in terms of scientific instrumentation. And so it's not economically viable to work in, you know, 45 nanometer or something like that. So for today's talk, I'm going to first talk a little bit, I'm going to get into the uh, details of designing neural signal amplifiers in silicon. Um, and so the first part of the talk will be very circuits oriented, and then we'll get into system level stuff. Uh, to talk about building an electrophysiology recording rig on a chip and then applying some of this technology to um, some more interesting cases of wireless neural telemetry from freely behaving insects, which was a, is a very challenging problem, and also uh, some other areas of neural recording, namely intracellular patch clamp recording and stimulation. So just to orient those of you who are not familiar with uh, biopotentials or the electrical signals produced by the body, uh, these are, this is a, a graph with logarithmic axes showing the frequency range and amplitude range of signals that you, you observe with extracellular electrodes, meaning electrodes that are in the body but not inside the cells themselves. And these are the type of electrodes that last the longest and are the most useful for scientific and medical applications. So you're all familiar, uh, at least in passing, with ECGs or EKGs. These are electrocardiograms. 
EMGs are electrical activity from muscles, but not the heart specifically. Um, then from the brain, we have uh, neural spikes or action potentials. These are the digital signals that neurons use to signal between each other on nerves or axons. Uh, local field potentials is sort of uh, low frequency aggregate signals that represent large groups of neurons firing in synchrony. And uh, if you observe those inside the brain, you call them LFPs. If you observe those outside the, outside the scalp, you call them EEGs, electroencephalograms, and the signal amplitude is much lower. But you can see that for all these biological signals, the frequency range is roughly that of audio, maybe a little lower than audio in some cases. Um, and the amplitude is in the range of low microvolts to low millivolts. So the requirements for designing a nice biopotential amplifier are that you should amplify the frequency bands of interest, which is audio and maybe lower frequencies. Um, for extracellular recording, you want to block DC offsets because uh, if the electrode tissue interface, you have a, usually a metal electrode touching an electrolytic solution in tissue, and that creates a small, weak battery, which leads to a DC offset of a couple hundred millivolts often. And that's usually three orders of magnitude larger than the AC signal that you want to observe. So if you don't block the DC signal of interest, you have a tremendous dynamic range problem. Um, so we want to block DC offsets to, to prevent saturation of our amplifiers. Uh, we need to have low enough input referred noise that we can see these signals down the microvolt level, but sufficient dynamic range to see signals that might be up in the millivolt level. We need to have a high input impedance because at, electrodes uh, have a very high source impedance. It depends on the type of electrode, but it's not uncommon for neural signal electrodes to have uh, signal impedances uh, or, or of source impedances in the mega ohm range. So it's a very, very weak signal that we're sensing. Um, we need to reject common mode signals, uh, particularly at power, power line frequencies because uh, quite often um, people are, or animals in, in experiments or human beings are, are in environments with a lot of uh, power line noise and you need to reject that. Um, and high power supply noise rejection is often important, particularly if you're powering these things wirelessly as you might be powering them from an AC source and your power supply might be a bit noisy. Um, they need to consume little silicon area and use few or no off-chip components to minimize size for implantable applications and consume little power to facilitate wearable or implantable applications. Uh, for one thing, you want your batteries to last a long time, or if you're delivering power wirelessly, you want to maximize your range. But also, even if you had all the power uh, at your disposal that you wanted, you can't dissipate that power if you have a device implanted inside the body because all the power that you burn heats the tissue and uh, there's really no place, if, you're, if you have an implantable device, there's no place for the heat to go but in the tissue. And to make a safe uh, medical device, you have to keep the, the ele you, you can't elevate the body temperature by more than about one degree C or you'll do long-term damage to the tissue. So it's a very hard limit on power consumption. So um, the problem at the turn of the century, about the time I started uh, looking into these problems, was that existing biosignal amplifiers, they were either too noisy or they consumed too much power or both. To, you know, we were looking to integrate about 100 of these to put them on the back of a Utah electrode array that, that had been developed at the University of Utah. And we did a literature search and we eventually plotted all the results on a graph like this. And we found that uh, this, so this is the supply current uh, required by the amplifier to operate. And this is the noise of the amplifier normalized to the square root of the bandwidth. And what you would see is that you could sometimes find some really low noise amplifiers, but they used a lot of power. Or you'd find a low power amplifier, but it had really high noise and couldn't see very small signals. And a lot of them weren't even fully integrated. They would, you know, a, a paper would say, well, our, our amplifier circuit only requires one or two external capacitors. Well, that's a problem if you want to integrate 100 of them on a chip, because not only do you need 100 external capacitors, but you need all the I.O. pins to connect to those capacitors. So we wanted something fully integrated with no off-chip components that had low power and low noise. And we found this nice um, 
uh, noise efficiency factor, which was defined by Stayert and colleagues back in 87, that sort of quantified the trade-off between power and noise. Uh, you would basically factor in the uh, supply current uh, required by the, the, the uh, amplifier, the bandwidth of the amplifier, and the noise. And any physical circuit that you build uh, cannot have a noise efficiency factor lower than one. You can show that it's physically impossible. So that gives you a nice floor. And in fact, if you have a differential amplifier, uh, which you need for almost all biomedical applications to amplify the difference between two signals, your noise efficiency ca factor can't be lower than two. So that was, we were immediately able to plot these ISO contours of noise efficiency factors here and see how close we were to the theoretical limit. And that was tremendously, tr tremendously useful um, because it gave us something to shoot for. And it also gave us something uh, because this was a time where people were starting to come out, come out with these MEMS uh, electrode arrays that had hundreds or thousands of electrodes and asking for things like, you know, can you build me some amplifiers that consume a microwatt each? And some of the things we were able to plug in and say, actually, no, it's physically impossible. So it's really nice to have these lower bounds, uh, both as targets to shoot for and as a quick method to eliminate things that are just physically impossible. Uh, so you don't waste a lot of time just trying to get to something that, that's not achievable. So um, we thought we could do better than noise efficiency factor of, if you look at the fully integrated, probably 20 was about the best that, that existed. So we developed a biopotential amplifier design that used an operational transconductance amplifier. And uh, you can sort of think of this as an op amp. And you, you may be used to seeing op amp circuits where you have two resistors that set the gain of the amplifier. Well, we use capacitors to set the gain of the amplifier, but just like with resistors, the ratio of the capacitor sets the gain of the amplifier, and capacitance is a very well controlled factor, particularly ratios of capacitance is very well controlled on chips, so we could get a well controlled gain. Um, and the capacitance at the input gave us our DC blocking capacitor, so that we had uh, a true cutoff at low frequencies, and we ignored the large off, built-in off DC offset at the electrode tissue interface. Um, and we were, by using uh, these devices here, pseudo-resistor devices, we call them, uh, we were able to achieve very, very low cutoff frequencies below one hertz, in fact, below a tenth of a hertz, without having to use large off-chip capacitors or, or things like that. Uh, the way we did that is that this low frequency cutoff is set by the product of the effective resistance of this device and capacitor C2. Now, all of these capacitors being on-chip capacitors are gonna be in the picofarad range. They're very small. So that tells you you need an extremely large resistance if you wanna set a frequency down at one hertz or so. Um, we were inspired uh, to use these devices um, by uh, Toby Delbrook and Carver Mead. Uh, they were at Caltech when I was there in the 90s and they developed this uh, circuit element, it's sort of a hack, uh, they developed it to make a, a long, a slow adaptive uh, photoreceptor to model long-term adaptation to light by photoreceptors in the retina. Um, and we repurposed this for our application, but it's basically a diode-connected PMOS transistor. So in one direction, it acts like a diode. And then in the other direction of current flow, you have a parasitic PNP transistor that's, uh, whether you like it or not, it's there. And that acts as a diode connected device, um, as a, a bipolar device. And so you basically have two diodes that are anti-parallel to each other. Um, and what that does is, as long as you keep the voltage across it very small, um, it's, it's a nonlinear device, but as long as the voltage swing is small, it acts as a very, very high value resistor, extremely high, giga ohms or more. So, uh, this is how it was originally used for this adaptive photoreceptor circuit by, by Carver Mead in the 90s. And uh, he used it for a neuromorphic retina. And, uh, but we use it in here, and then uh, that sets the low frequency cutoff. And then the high frequency cutoff um, is set by the transconductance of this amplifier, which is uh, uh, controlled by traditional means by adjusting the current in the amplifier. And this just shows a measured transfer function of uh, a typical device that we built that has a gain of about 200, and you can see the gain is very flat all the way down to 0.025 hertz without using any off-chip components. 
So we were able to get a very, very low frequency response without using big capacitors off chip. Um, the design of the operational transconductance amplifier is not critical. This is a, a current mirror amplifier design, but you could use folded cast code or telescopic or any of those other types of um, OTA designs that you've seen in textbooks. The bottom line for how to make it have a good trade-off between noise and power, to have low noise and at the same time low power, is to operate in, the current, in, in a current range of high nanoamps to low microamps. And this is a really nice place to operate analog circuits in CMOS because by adjusting the width to length ratio of the devices, just, just the geometric parameters, the size of the transistors, which you control when you draw the, the layout, you're able to push these devices either in weak inversion or subthreshold operation or strong inversion or above threshold operation with the same current flowing through them just by modulating the current density. So we operate the, the, differential, um, the differential pair transistors with an extremely large width to length ratio to force them into weak inversion or subthreshold. And in this area, they have their maximum transconductance per drain current. So transconductance is the gain of the transistor. Drain current is sort of the power you're expending, or it's proportional to the power you're expending to get that. So it's, think of it as like the economy of the transistor. You're getting more gain for your current dollar in, in weak inversion. It's the most efficient way, in some ways, to operate transistors. Uh, and then all of your, your current mirrors and current source loads you use width to length ratios even far less than one, which is a very untraditional way to draw transistors to make them longer than they are wide. You oftentimes don't see that. Um, but that ends up being a very useful design motif to force them into strong inversion. And they have a greatly reduced GM over I ratio, which sounds like a bad thing until you look at the way the, the GMs of these different transistors fall out in this equation that predicts the input referred noise. And you can see if you follow these guidelines up here, this term reduces to one, and you've minimized the noise for a particular bias current um, for this amplifier. So uh, just to remind you that uh, MOSFETs have a really nice property where as you change the control voltage, their output current uh, goes up over many orders of magnitude. Uh, this is a logarithmic axis. And the slope of this line is the transconductance. Um, well, if it were not a, a log axis. But you can see a, a bipolar device always has very high transconductance per current. But for a MOSFET, um, it, in subthreshold, you get a lot of transconductance per current. And then it starts dropping as you go uh, into above threshold. And so we want to operate some of our transistors in weak inversion and some in strong inversion to get very different ratios of transconductance for drain current. And we use uh, the EKV model, named after Enns, Krumenacher, and Vito, who popularized this in the 90s. And this is a really nice, it's a very simple equation that allows you to do back of the envelope calculations when you're designing circuits uh, before you get into detailed simulations. And it can predict uh, transconductances very accurately, even in this range of moderate inversion between weak and strong inversion. So using these design techniques, we were able, which we published in 2003, uh, we introduced a couple of amplifiers that had two very different bandwidths. We did an EEG amplifier and a neural amplifier. That's why they're two very different places on this graph. Um, but you can see they're, they're down here at a noise efficiency factor of four, which was much, much better than any in fully integrated designs before then. And since our publication has come out, other people have adapted our design techniques to their own circuits and, and uh, have you know, routinely published circuits now with noise efficiency factors down here around two to four. Um, I, the, the final comment I want to make on this is that noise efficiency factor is, it's lured a lot of people to try to absolutely minimize it and in some cases design rather poor circuits because even though it quantifies the trade-off between power and noise, it does not take into account a lot of other very important factors in circuit design like common mode rejection, and uh, controllability of your gain and things like that. So you have to balance other performance issues out as well. But uh, it gives you a guideline to know if you're making a good, a reasonable trade-off between power and noise in your amplifiers. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with PVT variations when you're in the sub-threshold 
region, you kind of touched on it, and the gain variation that you're going to end up with. I would assume you have a calibration algorithm that, that goes with this? Um, no, um, because this is an AC coupled amplifier anyway, and then we're able to, to we're able to tolerate some reasonable offsets. Uh, we're able to tolerate reasonable offsets afterwards. It just depends on what you're going to do with the data afterwards. I'll mention something that we do to get rid of offsets a little bit later. But one of the reasons that people are more concerned, uh, some people are scared of using transistors in subthreshold because they've heard that uh, mismatch is worse in subthreshold. And actually, the, um, the, mismatch, the, the variation in gate and threshold voltage is the same, regardless of what mode you're in. You just see it more in subthreshold because your transconductance per current is higher. And so it's, your, your, your knob is a lot more sensitive when you're operating down here. So for that reason, it's bad to use um, current mirrors. Uh, it's bad to use subthreshold current mirrors because you get terrible matching in the current that comes out versus what you push in. But it's actually a, it's a pretty good to use, uh, uh, use them as differential pairs. The, the mismatch doesn't hurt you very much in that way. Right. I guess we should take mismatch off the table. We were just talking about PVT variations okay. over process voltage temperature. I mean, doesn't the gain vary around quite a bit, I would assume? No, actually, um, you see that the gain is, well, the, the transconductance is just related to the bias current and the, uh, well, okay, so it's proportional to absolute temperature. Um, but the nice thing about designing for uh, implantable applications is you're pretty much guaranteed your temperature variations are going to be small. That's the only easy thing about designing for implantable electronics is you, you, your temperature range is going to be extremely small. Process variations, we haven't seen that to be a problem. Uh, and voltage will also be pretty well controlled uh, in, in most of these cases. Yeah, it's, we're not designing for automotive, that's, that's for sure, or military. So uh, what, we, what we did with uh, these circuits at, when I was at the University of Utah is uh, put them on the back of a Utah electrode array, which was a MEMS, uh, is a MEMS silicon electrode array. So you can see here the, the, the little tines of this electrode array pointing down on the penny. It's resting here as if the penny were the brain we were going to insert it into. And then on the back of this is a little gray slab, and that's our integrated circuit. That's our chip flip chip bonded onto the back of the array with 100 amplifiers. And then we powered this thing uh, using an RF coil which is here. And so we were able to send power to it at about 3 megahertz, um, about 30 milli, well, it was actually about 8 milliwatts of power. We kept it below 30 to minimize tissue heating. And then we did some data compression on the chip, which I won't go into, and sent data back out at a rate of about 300 kilobits per second. So um, that is sort of just a, basically how we design the amplifiers in silicon. Um, We've now commercialized this for electrophysiology uh, neuroscience applications. And this was based at uh, my company, Intan Technologies. This is a series of chips we introduced a few years ago that contain 32 and now 64, actually. We have a 64-channel version um, amplifiers of similar to the type that I just showed you with built-in 16-bit A to D converter um, and a serial peripheral a standard SPI interface to uh, program the amplifier bandwidth and bandwidths digitally. Um, and uh, to your point, Chris, we introduced some DSP high pass filters to remove residual offsets um, introduced by the analog, uh, the analog amplifier circuitry. We put in some auxiliary ADC inputs for interfacing other sensors, the ability to power down unused channels, um, you know, optimizing for low power operation and also building in electrode impedance measurement capability by allowing the user to inject small AC currents into the electrodes and then using the amplifier to, to see the resulting voltage. That allows you to measure your electrode impedance, which is a good way to diagnose changes to the electrode tissue interface over time. So uh, this is a commercial chip that we've uh, been selling for a number of years uh, in a QFN package or as a bare die. And so we basically have one chip where you plug electrodes into one side, and then you have serial digital data streaming out the other side. Um, this is just a block diagram of the chip showing multiple channels of two-stage amplifiers, uh, a multiplexer, uh, an on-chip on ADC with an SPI interface and some registers to configure things. And then we only need two external capacitors, a, a power supply capacitor and a capacitor to smooth out the ADC reference. 
Everything else is, is on chip. Um, and we've introduced a, an evaluation system around this that, so this is a, a little, what they call a head stage or an amplifier board that contains our chip and a connector to plug into electrodes and then a digital interface cable and an FPGA board that streams the data over to uh, a PC. And we have uh, open source software that allows users to observe the uh, spikes or neural data coming in and save it to disk and, and configure the bandwidth and sampling rate of the, of the amplifiers. So this just shows, I showed you this abstract diagram at the beginning of the talk showing the different types of biopotentials there are. So these are showing actual real biopotentials measured using our chip. Uh, and the same chip because we allowed the bandwidth to be configurable and because it has a wide dynamic range and signal amplitude, the same chip can be configured and optimized for any of these signals. So this is uh, what you would record off the surface of your skin as you're contracting your bicep. And a lot of prosthetic limbs are controlled this way, using residual muscles in the, in the upper arm, say, to control a prosthetic hand or wrist. Um, this is your ECG or EKG, your heartbeat. Um, and then these are, if you just stick an electrode in the brain, you will see a combination of low frequency signals, that's local field potentials or LFPs, and high frequency spikes or action potentials, which you can filter out if you like, and that's the communication of individual neurons in the brain. So uh, these are all the different types of signals you can see down in the microvolt range that we're observing with this chip. This shows a 64 channel uh, head stage that we designed using uh, the largest version of our chip to date which is a 64 ch amplifier chip that's bonded directly to a circuit board. Um, we coat this with epoxy to protect it from light and dust, but, but for photos, we just show it without the epoxy. And um, just as a point of comparison, uh, so this is, yeah, you have to have a very fine pitch circuit board and then you wire everything to it. Um, but to compare how we've come in 25 years of electrophysiology instrumentation, this is the, a picture of the world's first 64-channel recording system. It was developed by Marcus Meister when he was a postdoc at Caltech. He's now a, a professor at Caltech. Um, and he, this is one board that plugged into uh, an old, eventually it plugged into a Macintosh. And it, um, back in the days when there were Macintoshes, not Macs, right? It's that long ago. Um, and this is a circuit board that contains eight eight channels of amplifiers, so op amps and A to D converters and all that stuff. So you would need eight of these circuit boards to make 64 channels, which he, he had. And then 25 years later, we had um, shown to scale, reduced it now down to that level. And this is uh, now a version uh, made by NeuroNexus, a company that was a spinoff of the University of Michigan. They make silicon probes, and they've integrated this chip directly over via a flex cable with their uh, MEMS electrodes that go in the brain. So that's the idea, is to integrate, the, um, integrate these amplifier multiplexer digitizer chips as close as you can to the electrodes so that, number one, you don't have a lot of noise pickup on these uh, high impedance cables. And number two, you can have many, many channels here relayed, the data from that relayed over one thin serial data cable. So uh, the chips that I described are now being used um, in more than 40 countries worldwide. Um, and they're changing the way people are doing neuroscience by taking what used to be large pieces of rack-mounted electronics and putting them all on uh, very close to the electrodes. So uh, what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk is a couple of applications of this. Once you miniaturize the amplifiers and the signal acquisition electronics, then you can start to do experiments that you never thought of before, you never considered before. Um, and the thing that a lot of neuroscientists are very interested in doing is observing how the brain works um, during free movement and free behavior. Um, not when an animal or a human is sort of pinned down doing a very unnatural task. Um, and so to understand the brain, people study all sorts of, of animals. Um, and some of the uh, things people are interested in are best studied at the level of insects, believe it or not. Um, insects are, are very interesting to study from a neuroscience standpoint because 
uh, one of the most interesting things about insect brains is that um, if you look in our brains, you see the same types of neurons from my brain to your brain, or my brain to my uh, you know, twin brother's brain, let's say, but the wiring is not the same from one person to the next. It's all wired up uh, individual, or you know, based on the individual. In, in, uh, in insects, which have many fewer neurons than we do, there are a lot of large types of neurons that are the same neuron from one uh, animal to the next. They're uniquely identifiable neurons that you can find repeatedly in every member of the species. So you can actually ask, what does this particular neuron do? Um, and because these animals have many fewer neurons in their brain, though it's hundreds of thousands or millions in, in any case, still their, their neurons may do more specialized and more sophisticated things than our more numerous and general purpose neurons, perhaps. And one of the more interesting, and because insects have a, a simpler set of behaviors than, say, uh, humans or primates or something like that, um, it's very, it's oftentimes easier to associate individual neurons with specific sensory motor behaviors. Um, as an example, uh, a neuron that's been studied for decades has been uh, the LGMD and corresponding DCMD neuron in uh, locust or grasshopper. And what this does, it's uh, a neuron that you can easily access via the nerve cord of the animal, of course, sort of corresponds to our spinal cord. And this part of the neuron uh, innervates the retina, underneath the retina of the animal, so it's visually mediated response. And then it goes down the spinal cord to drive muscles related to movement, legs and wing muscles. And what happens is uh, this neuron is triggered by visual cues, very particular visual cues, and that is looming stimuli, things moving towards the animal. So you can take one of these insects, access this neuron, and then as you move things around the room, it doesn't respond, but if you move something towards the insect, suddenly it responds like crazy, and it causes the animal to jump or fly out of the way. It has obvious survival value, right? It protects you from getting eaten by birds that are swooping down to eat you. Um, and it would also be really interesting to find out how this thing works, since we're now trying to make self-driving cars that don't allow you to hit the car in front of you, or if another car swerves into your lane, allow you to avoid it. So it does something very interesting with an extremely limited amount of hardware and a, and a tiny amount of power. And it's, so it's of interest to engineers and neuroscientists. And this just shows the firing rate, spikes per second, essentially, or spikes per millisecond of this cell as an object is on a collision course and would collide at time zero. So you see it, it starts bursting rapidly a few hundred milliseconds, warning the animal to get out of the way. So I have a colleague. Um, who studies this, and he was very interested in studying this not in animals that are pinned down to the ground, but uh, in animals that are freely moving and can actually jump out of the way. So we, a few years ago, designed a, a telemetry chip that would be small and light enough to be carried on the back of a freely moving grasshopper. Um, we did this uh, in, uh, by integrating a couple of the amplifiers that I talked to you about, some optimized for neural signals, some optimized for EMGs, muscle signals, and we multiplexed those to a modest 9-bit ADC. We had a crystal oscillator to set the sampling rate to a well-known value, and then we used that to the, the digital data to modulate uh, an FM oscillator, essentially, and drive um, FSK um, RF information out. This shows the uh, battery-powered backpack. We powered it off of two watch batteries and it was able to run for about two hours off of a supply current of a little less than a milliamp. And we got the mass down to a little less than a gram. Just for reference, a business card weighs a gram, it's about. So less than a business card. Um, and we were able to, with these antennas, uh, get a telemetry range of greater than two meters and sample information at these sampling rates and bandwidths. And we also put a three-axis accelerometer on this, not on the chip, but we just bought one from analog devices that since they're readily available now, and we made sure our chip had some auxiliary analog inputs that it sampled so we could sample the accelerometer as well as our other channels. Uh, this just shows a custom receiver that we built to receive the data from it and link it over USB to the computer. 
and how we would solder the electrodes to the device. And this shows the device on, on a, uh, a, a, one of our willing participants here. Um, and this is for Bertio Gabbiani, is the professor who was doing his experiments at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And so uh, a lot of these things that you see, these little silvery things at the top were just sort of makeshift connectors. These can all be eliminated uh, by just hand soldering the electrodes uh, to this device. And uh, this is a video of the animal. It's sitting on a stick. This little thing that it's on is a stick that it, it basically was, was in a little cage off, off camera to the right here. And uh, before the video started, it walked out of its cage to the end of the stick and just sat there because there was no other place to go. It was like the end of the plank. And um, it's in front of a computer monitor here. And so you're going to see um, a black circle getting larger and larger as it's simulating an approaching round object on a collision course with it. And you'll see the animal jump out of the way at the last minute. Um, and we have, uh, it's connected to a neural channel, an electrode in one of the neurons, and then also a couple of EMG channels related to <coughs> leg muscles. So we're, all of this stuff is being wirelessly telemetered and recorded at the same time along with acceleration data. But what I'm going to play for you right now with the video is the audio from just the neural channel from one of these neurons. It's a very, very fast jump. Um, I'll play it again. So you hear the neural activity, the spiking faster and faster and faster, and eventually it triggers an escape response. This is the same video, but now we'll listen to the EMG, that's the electro, electro uh, myogram, the, the electrical potential from the muscle in the leg extensor muscle. And it's going to be much lower frequency. It's not these high frequency spikes, so it'll sound more like a low frequency rumble. And you only hear it at the end because that's when the decision is made to move. So there's computation and then movement. And if we now look at the data that we just heard, plotted, this is the angular size of the stimulus on the retina of the animal. And this is the neural activity, which then at some point the animal makes a decision to jump. And it does so in a peculiar way. It actually stores energy for a couple hundred milliseconds by contract, co-contracting both the leg flexor and extensor. So it's like you contracting both your bicep and tricep. It basically sort of loads up a spring, and then an, presumably another muscle that's not shown here triggers and sort of flips a mechanical switch, and then that energy is released. And you get this tremendous acceleration, which it, it, our accelerometers flattened out at about, uh, saturated at about 3 Gs. Um, grasshoppers, when they jump, they're pulling about 12 or 14 Gs. Um, and then you see, actually, it's, it's kind of funny because you see this, this acceleration signal is actually sitting at 1 G, which is just gravity, since accelerometers also sense gravity. And then after the jump, it's at 0 G because it's in ballistic free, free fall as it's you know, flying across the room ballistically. But um, this was very interesting. It, it gave us a lot of information. And what the, the biologists working on this project saw is that the neural activity, uh, they've done these experiments for, for decades on animals that are basically held down so they can't actually jump. And they just record the neural activity as they play different stim visual stimuli and try to tease apart how this neuron processes the visual information. But uh, what we saw in this experiment is that the the magnitude of the neural activity, the, 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 the level of the neural activity was two or three times greater than they had ever seen before just because the animal was, was free to actually move around. For some reason, that actually made the neuron a lot more active. And it shows you that these systems are very, very complex. And just the ability to just knowing you're not tied down, I guess, uh, changes a lot of things about the, the entire nervous system. And so it, it sort of suggest that if we want to understand how brain, brains and nervous systems work, then we need to explore them and measure them in the most natural settings that we can with freely behaving systems. So the next thing, because uh, that wasn't hard enough, we decided that we would also like to record from freely flying dragonflies, because they do some very interesting things, whereas grasshoppers are just sort of herbivores that eat, eat grass and try not to get captured. 
uh, dragonflies are predators that try to eat mosquitoes and other insects in midair, capture them in midair and eat them. And they have some very, very interesting visually, visual processing that goes on to find, to find uh, moving, 3D moving uh, uh, targets and then track them in three dimensions and change their course so that they intercept uh, this, this target. So this was done with Anthony Leonardo at uh, HHMI, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and also Matt Reynolds here at University of Washington. So this shows uh, what we're, why we're interested in the dragonfly. If you see here, this is a high-speed video of a fruit fly, which is really great food for a dragonfly. You see the fruit fly flying here, um, turning around, and then the dragonfly spots it, um, starts some complex control of all of its wings, plots a course, and does a nice curved trajectory, extends all its legs, captures and eats the fruit fly. So clearly there's an incredible amount of sophisticated processing going on there with a very small brain, calculating all the aerodynamics and trajectories. Um, so Anthony is able to track these, these, uh, these, the body and head movements of the dragonflies and what we would like to do is fill in the neural data, what's going on inside the brain when these animals are processing all this information in real time. So we went through several iterations of making our, uh, our insect telemetry chips smaller and smaller and smaller, um, getting them down to 100 milligrams, and we were able to telemeter uh, wireless data from a dragonfly nerve cord. This is just a perched dragonfly, but this is just showing spikes that we recorded wirelessly from the dragonfly. And then working with Matt Reynolds, uh, that gave us the, really the key piece of technology we needed to get the size and mass down even more, which is to use um, backscatter telemetry and to power the device uh, from the antenna, to have no battery at all, and to broadcast um, a power waveform to the device, have this uh, telemetry IC recover power and then backscatter data backwards by modulating the impedance of its antenna. And we were able to do this, uh, we developed a chip to do this that had a backscatter rate of five megabits per second, which gave us the ability to broadcast uh, 10 channels of neural information, which was very, very good. We used on-chip Schottky diodes and capacitors as a voltage multiplier to go from a very low voltage on an antenna up to 1.2 volts that we used for our chip power supply. And this is just a block diagram of our chip. 10 neural amplifiers, four EMG amplifiers for looking at muscles, um, an 11-bit ADC, putting in some, some Hamming encoding uh, with a, a, and Manchester encoding to make the data a little bit more robust and then some voltage regulators and, and, and uh, impedance modulator to send the data back over the antenna. So this is the chip that we developed um, and uh, containing all this about th two and a half by two millimeters. Um, and the power breakdown is, it's a total power consumption of about 1.2 milliwatts, most of that going into the amplifiers and the ADCs. This shows digital data received about a meter away. And so this is the final backpack on the Dragonfly with a dipole antenna. And we got it down to 38 milligrams, which is really, really fantastic, uh, thanks to this uh, new powering and, and data technique. And uh, this is a, a nice hook microelectrode uh, made at Genelia to pierce the Dragonfly nerve cord and record multiple signals from the nerve cord. And this is some preliminary data of uh, neural spikes recorded from the nerve cord of the dragonfly. Um, oh, sorry, this is pre-recorded neural data, but now we, we do have, we do have uh, now data from uh, freely flying dragonflies with real neural signals uh, that looks very similar to this. So uh, we're just getting to the point now where we're able to start looking into running real experiments with this. Um, and it's been quite a technological challenge um, along many fronts with, uh, with Matt's RF work and with our chip work and Anthony's work on the, on the biology side of it. So um, I just want to spend five more minutes here talking about just a few other corners of electrophysiology that are also um, amenable to uh, improvement by silicon chips. And that is uh, patch clamp recording and stimulation. 
So patch clamp recording is a, a, a method for intracellular, intracellular recording. Everything we've talked about now, you would put an electrode inside the, the brain, but you actually would just be near the cells. And you would see very small microvolt level signals uh, resulting from currents returning, uh, currents flowing through the extracellular solution. But uh, a technique developed in the 70s that uh, was worth the Nobel Prize um, is to basically take a glass micropipette electrode, which you can take by taking a, a fine glass capillary tube, putting it over a flame or a heat source, and pulling it apart as it melts. And you can create um, a very fine tip that you can see here with an opening uh, about a micron in diameter. And you can take that very fine tipped glass tube, you can fill it with salt water and put a little wire in it to connect to it electrically. And then you can actually put it on a micro manipulator, look under a microscope, and use it to gently touch a, a cell like a neuron. And then you can actually, believe it or not, uh, it's, it's amazing that, that, uh, that this works, but you can actually um, touch the cell, form a very, very good seal, a greater than a giga ohm electric seal with the cell, and then break into the cell using suction or voltage pulses and maintain direct electrical contact with the inside of one cell. It's just a few microns across. And you can hold that for maybe an hour or so. Um, it's not something you would use for a long-term medical device because you can't, you can't record from an individual neuron for days or weeks, but for a few hours, it's, a, it's an invaluable tool for, uh, for neuroscience and also for drug discovery because it allows you to see how even non-neural cells work with the ion channels and electrical properties of them. So it's used in all, all over neuroscience and molecular biology. Um, and you can do two things once you have direct electrical contact with the inside of the cell. You can do what's called voltage clamp recording, and that's where you use a feedback loop to clamp the voltage of the cell at a particular level, and then you measure how much current is flowing through all the ion channels in the cell to hold that voltage. And you measure picoamps to nanoamps, so it's small currents. Or you can do current clamp recording, where you inject currents into the cell, and you see what the intracellular voltage does. And here you can see millivolts of, of uh, of, of amplitudes, and you can tell a little bit more what a neuron is doing when you're looking inside it. So we've recently, very recently, it hasn't been released commercially, but will be this summer, we've actually taken all of the complex electronics in patch clamping, and we've uh, designed it, uh, we've reduced it onto a single chip with a few off-chip components, um, so that now this is the, the little glass micropipette I was telling you about. And this allows us to contact um, directly to a cell and measure these tiny currents. We had to do some special things for ultra-low current sensing. Um, we had to package the chip in a package with, with leads on it so that you could actually lift the lead of this, the uh, sense amplifier input and solder a wire directly to it from, say, this connector. If you see, there's a little wire there because you don't even, when you're sensing picoamps, you don't even want to touch a circuit board because if, if even a fingerprint smudge on a circuit board can conduct uh, hun hundreds of picoamps if you have a couple of volts across it. So there's lots of little tricks with the design of it, but we, um, we have recently tested this at Georgia Tech and at MIT with Craig Forrest and Ed Boyden's labs, and uh, we're able to get very good accuracy uh, noise floors in, in current, so this is what happens if you poke a neuron, you get inside the cell, and you inject steps of current. Um, you either suppress the cell, the cell's voltage, or you, uh, you, you, if you inject positive current, you can make a neuron start to fire action potentials or spikes. That's what's happening here. So um, we can activate neurons this way. We, our noise floors are actually lower than, uh, than uh, existing commercial devices. And in voltage clamp mode, we have current noise levels that are about two picoamps RMS, which is not quite as low, but approaching the levels of commercial devices and certainly good enough for whole cell recordings. So you can really think about neural interfacing in terms of four quadrants, extracellular and intracellular and recording and stimulation. I spent most of the talk talking about this upper left quadrant, recording from extracellular electrodes. 
intracellular, the patch clamp stuff, are these two bottom uh, uh, quadrants. And the last thing is extracellular stimulation. And here you want to apply charge balance uh, current pulses. And so just as the last slide, I want to show you a chip that we ha have recently, recently developed that we'll be rolling out this year commercially, which is a chip to do just this, 16 independent stimulation and amplifier channels with a digital interface. And this will allow people to interface with, say, spinal cords or, or other parts of the nervous system and actually cause, uh, electric, to cause neurons to fire, to inject signals, and then measure the results as well. In order, in order to do this, you have to, in order to stimulate through high impedance electrodes, you have to use high voltage CMOS processes to get you know, tens of volts of compliance in order to get enough overhead voltage to stimulate uh, through microelectrodes. So with that, I'll just uh, sort of give credit to our, uh, our funding for a lot of this. And I mentioned uh, the, the Dragonfly stuff was done with Matt Reynolds here at Washington. Um, and I'd like to just thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions if you have them. Thanks. Questions for Reed? Could, could you say a few words about commercializing your work? What, what are the challenges you found in, in uh, bringing technology from the university to uh, a small company? Yeah, so um, my experience in bringing technology from the university to a company is probably very different than people going after, uh, say, a large consumer market. In some ways, it's easier. In some ways, it's harder. It's easier because um, essentially most of my market research was done as when I was a professor attending conferences, attending neuroscience conferences as an engineer talking about this and having you know, biologists and bioengineers come up to me and say, this, this looks great, what I really need is this or what we need is this. And, and, and so um, it was a very natural transition in terms of learning about the market because it's a highly technical market that we saw um, from an academic, you know, from academic uh, conferences and things like that. Um, but you don't have, you're not going after an enormous um, uh, uh, consumer market, and so you're not as appealing to VC uh, funding agencies. So you can see we, we've used um, SBIR, Small Business Innovative Research Grants, which are very good at funding this type of, uh, um, this type of uh, technology. And we use that and, and some consulting uh, to, to get bootstrapped. We essentially self-bootstrapped. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, so. So in, in some regards, it was a little different than the traditional approach. But other questions? Yeah. Uh, could you say a little more about the uh, uh, stimulation recording device? How you handle the switching, for example? How much artifacts there might be on adjacent recording channels when you stimulate? And what the yeah. time is? That's um, actually here's an extra slide I threw in just to, for the stimulation. This is the, the way that you would stimulate uh, through extracellular electrodes. Is you you typically do these biphasic current pulses, where you try to keep the area under these two curves the same, so that you don't put any net charge. You you don't deliver any net charge to the tissue long term. That prevents electrochemical reactions from happening. But you get very large voltage swings um, on the. Uh, across the capacitance uh, that dominates the electrode tissue interface. So we have methods in our amplifiers to basically dynamically shift the bandwidth of the amplifier. So instead of having a one hertz cutoff, which means you have a very long time constant associated with that one hertz, after, while we're stimulating and immediately afterwards, we can bring that, switch that one hertz cutoff up to a few hundred hertz so that the amplifier quickly recovers and then go back to one hertz to see local field potential activity afterwards. This is something that we're still characterizing. We've, we've partnered, our company's based in Los Angeles and we've partnered with a lab at Caltech, uh, Thanos Siopas' lab, uh, who does uh, rat work. And over the next few months, we're going to be characterizing the artifact recovery circuits there with real electrodes and real tissue because one of the challenges you have as a circuit designer is that there's no good circuit model of the electrode tissue interface, particularly in stimulation. And so it's very difficult to uh, evaluate this when you're simulating a circuit. You really have to design things and then go put them in with real electrodes and real tissue. So 
We have something we think will work and we, we think will recover within two milliseconds after a stimulation pulse, but we have to, we have to test it out and see. All right, let's thank Reed very much for coming to see today. Thank you.